Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the Content Marketing Institute's De Demand Generation Summit. It's our fourth annual. We're so happy to have you here. Hopefully you caught the first session, but if you didn't, no worries, we've got you covered. It'll be available on demand in about 24 hours. It was a really high energy session uh, from Tyler Lassard at Vidyard, and I think you'll want to check it out for sure. Um, we're really excited about this session as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about creating memorable experiences with your content. And we've got some wonderful experts. It's, it's a little bit of fandom going on here because two of my favorites from Content Marketing World, many years of speaking at Content Marketing World and being part of our community are here. Uh, Michael Brenner, who is the CEO of the Marketing Insider Group. Hey, Michael. Hey. And Pam Didner, who's a B2B tech marketing consultant. Pam, hello. hello. So great to hello, see everybody. you. So great Thank to see you, you both. Right and folks, uh, Jody Veder, Veder, the amazing Jody Veder, who is head of demand gen at Televerde, is going to be moderating this discussion. Unfortunately, she's having some video problems, but she's here with us on the phone. And Jody, I'll turn it over to you. I wish we could see you, but I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I wish you could see me too. Hello, CMI Nation. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jody Veter, Demand Generation Leader for Televerde. Televerde is the preferred global revenue creation partner supporting marketing, sales, and customer experience for B2B organizations around the world. Powered by a purpose to transform lives and grow revenue for our customers, we deliver end-to-end -end on the full life cycle of revenue generation from marketing to sales to customer experience. I'm going to do a little introduction myself uh, of our esteemed guests. I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with two amazing, amazing guests today. You're very lucky to be tuning in. First, Pam Didner, founder of Relentless Pursuit, a sales marketing keynote, a podcaster, and author of Global Content Marketing, Effective Sales Enablement, and the Modern AI Marketer. Second, but not least, Michael Brenner. He is a speaker, CEO of Marketing Insider Group, and author of Content Formula, and I really love this, Mean People Suck. They're going to share their expertise. <laughs> love that book. <laughs> Yay. Um, they're going to share their expertise on how to create engaging experiences with content that not only delight, but also convert them to buyers and happy customers. And knowing these two, we're likely to have some fun in the process. Welcome, Pam and Mike. Yeah, glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Jody. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Michael and Pam, please share with us a little bit about how you feel this digital transformation that we're currently in has changed the customer journey life cycle. Yeah, Pam, if you don't mind, I'll go, I'll go first. Um, please, please. Thanks. Yeah, it, it's, you know, as soon as the pandemic hit, I was, I was really um, sort of geeking out with some of the data. Um, McKinsey came out with a report really quickly that said that digital sales interactions online had increased by two to three times. Um, internet mm -hmm. live sats saw uh, global daily searches go from, most people don't realize this, I think 3.5 billion to 7 billion daily searches. So, you know, as soon as we locked down March 13th or, or 12th of last year, we all jumped on Google and started searching up stuff. And one of the biggest things we were searching for was digital transformation. And, and so, you know, I think, um, you know, I love to say that the things that were happening before uh, just, you know, were, became accelerated with the, the lockdown and, and the pandemic and digital transformation is now uh, no longer an option. Uh, digital content marketing, uh, creating, you know, great experiences for, for buyers uh, is now the only thing that we can really focus on um, uh, to, I think, basically attract new buyers and, and grow our business. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to add an additional point. Yeah, if anybody have seen an internet meme that's been flowing around, basically we started with the question, you know, who accelerated digital transformation in your company? A is CEO, B is CIO, and C is COVID-19. 
<laughs> obviously the answer is, you know, whatever. And you know what that answer is. So we obviously have seen the digital uh, or the, the surge of the, the digital usage, which is beyond the, the Black Friday or even Cyber Monday. Now the, the digital digital usage or the surge is everyday thing. And that has a huge impact on the marketing specifically, especially uh, we have to look at the customer journey, the number of the, uh, the touch points, if you will, on the digital front have increased. And you have to look at in terms of your customer journey uh, adding additional digital point and what that is and where that should be and how you should engage that with your customers. Yeah, it's a great point. And Jody, if you know, if I may, I mean, you guys, I think the, the graphic you've got up here, you call it the infinity loop. I think it's, it's a, a great example of what we've seen. You know, it's not a linear yeah. journey. It's not a funnel. We we're seeing, you know, yeah. reach engage, convert and retention happening in this sort of infinite loop and, and cycle that's involving um, my, one of my favorite marketing quotes is David Packard from Hewlett Packard said, marketing is too important to be left to the marketing department. And and I think you really capture that really well with this, this graphic. That's awesome. Thank you very much. This is, I have a question that's fairly similar and feeds off of your two comments. Um, how do we ensure the needs of prospects and customers are front and center no matter what stage of the customer life cycle they are in. And just as importantly, you have the difference between prospects and customers and how we have to continue to engage both and not forget about the customers. Do you want to go ahead and start, Michael? Yeah, please. Um, I think one thing uh, in terms of keeping the customer front and center is um, having a customer journey map and also have a buyer's persona within the company. And um, whenever it is a conversation, it doesn't matter if it's a product conversation or even a, a marketing conversation or a, a sales conversation, uh, have a discussion in terms of when it, whenever we talk about product, but really look into the customer journeys and also buyer's persona. And uh, also educate um, the internal customers that they also have a sense of like have a customer in mind and in general, in any big enterprises, uh, Michael, you probably can attest to that, we tend to talk about our products a lot. It's all, it's all about our products. It's all about our technology and how we're going to communicate that. And I think that mindset uh, obviously needs to be changed. And, um, and to drive that is really a journey of education and um, started uh, with the marketing and have that conversation with the product team, have a conversation with the sales team, and then start talking about the customer's needs. Your thought? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, my favorite thing to do is to Google it, you know, and, and Pam, you've heard me tell this story a hundred times. When, when I was at SAP and we were selling SAP cloud computing solutions, I had to show our marketing team that no one was searching for SAP cloud computing solutions but they were searching for cloud computing solutions. Yeah. And we weren't creating any content about the cloud, we were creating content about us. And, and yeah. you know, the interesting thing, again, I, lo you know, I love this, this graphic you, you, you guys came up with at, uh, at Televerdi, Jody. Marketing, customer service, sales, I mean, really all of the customer facing functions in an organization need to come together and, and put the customer at the center. And, and that's, you know, the whole point of my book, uh, Mean People Suck, was all about, trying to talk about marketing in the context of, of putting customers center to the culture of organizations, but then the really rapid realization that that means, wait a minute, we, we need to bring customer service and sales and, and even support functions need to start to line up behind customer needs. You know, one of the things that always drove me nuts was the sort of executive worship that happens, I think at large companies, Pam and I both have been through that. You know, it's like, exactly. or people, and my favorite line was people would say, my VP, like, what, do you own your VP, your boss? Like, what does that even mean, my VP or, or my KPI? <laughs> what, what does that mean? Like, aren't we all here to try to grow the business? Like, let's come together. And, and the way to do that, I think the, the way that that happens is by, you know, putting the customer at the center and, and asking really in a way like, Hey, is this brochure going to really serve a customer or prospect need? Or, um, you know, are there ways, you know, one of the, you know, we all know one of the best ways to grow is, is customer retention strategies. Well, have you asked your customers if they could refer or recommend two or three people to you? I mean, simple things that you would do when you put the customer at the center and you realize that retention is really the heart of, of both, you know, marketing and service. 
Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I was one of them. <laughs> My VP say this. <laughs> But at the same time, I totally understand internal politics can be an issue. And unfortunately, that's a reality as well. And uh, I totally understand uh, Michael's perspective. But I also understand marketers sometimes have to work in the fine line that you have to kind of make peace with your internal stakeholders, but also um, create something that's relevant for your internal customers. And uh, I do agree with Michael's point of view that sometimes your, your VP or your management have a very specific or strong point of view about how things need to be done. It's very important for you to actually uh, explain from your customer's perspective. You may not be successful or uh, succeed every single time, but it's nice to actually have a point of view and to speak on behalf of your customers. Yeah, I, you just reminded me of a stat that I that I love, Jody. If you don't mind me just making this one quick point, the uh, the, the um, I wrote an article that your marketing director is miserable unless they do this, and uh, this, this research actually shows that directors of marketing and IT are the most miserable corporate function. And, you know, so basically, basically everyone on this call and and you know are on this on this webinar, and and it's crazy. The the ones that are happy are actually ones that feel like they're they're serving their customer needs and showing an impact to the business. And so, you know, that's all you have to do is just let them, let us deliver value to customers and, and measure impact. And, you know, that's kind of the way to, yeah. to map the customer journey to the company of, you know, objectives and goals. Right. Hey, Jody, I know people are asking questions and I want to follow your process. Will we have time to answer uh, the, the attendees uh, questions or um, at the end or how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. I'm watching the clock and I'm going to leave at least five minutes for Q&A or at least try to. Um, and no matter what, we'll get back to our attendees and answer their questions um, again, hopefully on, on the call live. Okay, awesome. Okay, awesome. Well, I was going to make a comment about how historically marketing, we just love talking about ourselves and how we've transformed. It's actually quite crazy. But let's get into content itself. When we think about the process for creating new content, I'd love to hear both of your top considerations and what you would advise our audience to consider when creating content. Either one of you, Michael or Pam? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, Pam, if, if you want to think for a minute. I, I mean, it, it's also related, I think, to the, one of the questions I see in the chat from Daisy on how do you determine customer needs on a large scale. Um, the, 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 to me, the, the answer really comes down to um, answering all of the questions that your buyers are asking. And in the digital world we live in, that's a knowable thing. So you sell something, but what problem does that something solve? Define that. I love to say to our clients, marinate in the pain. If you if you go to watch a good movie on Netflix or on Amazon Prime, uh, you know an hour and forty five minutes is the is the the challenge, the the journey, the the struggle of the you know the protagonist. The the last five minutes, I just watched a movie last night, um, uh, Olympus Has Fallen or something about the you know the White House being attacked by terrorists. They they didn't get the bad guy until the last five minutes of the movie. And and why we need to do that with our marketing, we need to understand the what, why, and how questions the problem and challenges that our audiences are, are facing, and then you know, sort of start to help them understand that we, we feel their pain, we have empathy for them. Of course, they're gonna search out our solution on their own when they're ready. And we need to make paths that are, that are you know, sort of easy for them to follow, um, to nurture them to conversion, if you will. But, but I think most of the companies we look at and we work with, there's the biggest gap in that what, why, and how stage of the buying process. Yeah, so I want to elaborate that a little bit more, and I agree with what Michael uh, shared with every uh, share with us in terms of hey, uh, to, to determine the customer's need is actually try to understand and the uh, customer's pain point and answer their questions. I want to take that framework and develop a little bit more. Obviously, you have to categorize that in the customer journey, and it depends on how you define your customer journeys. Right in some company, in some company, they define their customer journey kind of like um, awareness, consideration, purchase, which is very typical. And one of my clients, they defined it as learn, 
you know, they have about learn about the technology, learn about the product plan. They have to plan about, you know, how to do the purchase, how to do a sourcing. They make a decision in terms of what product they want to buy and they purchase. So their, their cycle is learn, plan, decide, and the purchase. So once you define that categories or co-ed customer journey, co-ed sales stages, whatever you want to call them, define that first. And then I agree with Michael that look at each stage that you define. Identify the questions that people might ask at that stage and then answer them. Then create the content to actually answer them. You know, at the learn stage, they probably want to know about a specific technology. Maybe you can create something, print the bracket technology bracket 101. You know, or 10 things you need to know about something. And that you, you see as some of, you know, those kind of content can be pretty popular, but it's okay. You can create original content and that's coming from you and you have a specific point of view about that technology. So that's how, you know, so I'm taking Michael's point and then just break it down. Okay. Back to you, Jody. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you to both of you. I think it's a good time right now to pull our audience I believe I have, yep, I have a slide. How is your organization approaching content in the digital landscape? We'd love to hear from our audience. And while the Jeopardy music is playing, Michael, Pam, any idea what the audience is going to answer? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, you know, we're, we're seeing hybrid everything right now, hybrid cloud, hybrid work. Um, I think the answer is going to be, you know, pretty much a mix. I think people are doing it within with a combination of in-house and outsourced experts. Um, you're going to see, yeah. and the Content Marketing Institute uh, research shows every year, there's just way too many people that don't have a plan at all, um, or they haven't documented it. Um, so you're going to see some folks that are in denial, uh, but but I think in general, most most folks are, are doing a combination of both. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to click the results. We've had a third of our attendees answer. And so let's see what they say. Got this. Any, That's actually any surprises? No, I think uh, for people that actually come to the CMI, uh, um, I would say website or even events, they seems to actually have some sort of content uh, strategies or even tactic in place. So I can see that. I, I, I'm not totally surprised by it. What do you think, mm -hmm. Michael? Yeah, no, like I said, I, th I thought it would be a mix. I mean, um, I, you know, usually I think the folks that admitted they're in denial, I give you credit. Um, it's probably twice that number. <laughs> um, you know, so just knowing the data, you know, from a larger set, um, maybe this is maybe this group is the best group ever. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, in general, we see, you know, about 10 percent of folks, you know, just don't really have a plan going uh, at all. And a lot of it is, I think, back to the politics and, and the, the corporate complexities that uh, that Pam alluded to earlier. And also the budget discussion. A lot of time is also budget yeah. and resources. Right. They are not necessarily prioritized and make that uh, a prior um, um, of uh, attack, uh, uh, an issue yeah. that they need to tackle. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, either one of you can take this or both of you. Uh, take us through how marketers and content strategists match content to the right stages of the customer journey. We know that every company is different, every journey is different. And then why should marketers embrace the notion and not be overwhelmed with it? Yeah, I, I mean, I've, uh, I've got a quick tip. Uh, Pam, you want me to go first? You mind? Yes, I do. No, not at all. Go. I'm, so I'm going to share just a quick tool. Um, AnswerThePublic.com is completely free. You can go to that website, AnswerThePublic.com, type the category name of your solution. So I'm a content marketing agency. Uh, go type in content marketing or content marketing agency. And, and that tool will show you all of the questions that people ask at the various stages that they're in. What is content marketing? Why do I need it? Should I outsource it? Should I do it in-house? Uh, what are the stages? What are the steps? What are the tips? What are the tools? Who are the experts? What are the conferences? All of those questions are laid out in a beautiful mind map, and anyone can use that tool for free to essentially define your editorial calendar. 
that will map content to the buyer journey. So I, you know, I'm not a paid endorser or anything. It's just, I, I just love it because it's a great way for folks that may be listening to this to take a visualization of what an editorial strategy should look like, mapping content to the buyer journey and present it to their boss who maybe doesn't understand. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a great suggestion. Another thing that I tend to do, or at least working with my client, is actually talk to the customers directly. I know a lot of time in the big enterprises, salespeople don't want you to actually talk to their customers directly. And uh, you can negotiate that and uh, have a conversation with your, um, your customers and even prospects that kind of going through the stages uh, in terms of, hey, how do they usually do search? and what kind of information they usually gather, how many times they come back to your website, and um, and what kind of content they tend to download. And that kind of information, the insight, complement you know, to what Michael just talked about. One is external search, and uh, the other one is internal uh, research, and have both information to validate your point of view to determine your customer journey. That's brilliant, and it's also a great segue to my next question. We know the buyer owns his or her journey. I'd like to take a deeper dive into personalization and how it plays a role in successful content strategy. Um, both of you, I know, have insights, tips, or even revelations that you can share with our audience. And as importantly, how do we do that at scale? Um, let me uh, start with that. And uh, I think personalization is the holy grail of a marketing. Imagine that you can actually personalize your outreach and then share that at the individual level. That would be amazing moving forward. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of time we cannot do that and due to a resource budget or technology challenges and the one level, um, the compromise that we do tend to be segmentation. Segmentation is actually a form of a personalization. But my take on this is you can take a little bit deeper between the segmentation and personalization. You cannot do like a personalized outreach to every single one of them, right? But maybe there's a, a, a balance between the two. For example, if your company have a webinar, right? You send out the email webinar registration as a promo email all the time. But is it possible you can look into the, the people that attended the webinar last three times? And then you send a personal invitation to them and say, thank you so much for coming to the webinar in the past three times. Love, love, love you to come to this one. Or you can send them the invitation to uh, a free pass to come, uh, come to your customer event. So that's also a form of a personalization. From my perspective, the personalization comes from you have to look at the data. You have to look at the data and look at your audience in terms of what they've been doing, you know, either on your website or engage with you. And you have to analyze that. And then it does take a lot of time. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not, right? It does take a lot of time. And then once you actually understand the data and then use that as a way to reach out. So Michael, I'm pretty sure you have additional ideas to share. No, I I, I, I completely agree with what you said, Pam. And, and, you know, one of the things, I think the only thing I'd add is just, you know, the, I, I call it the paradox of automation. Um, the more we automate stuff, the more human we need to be. And and yeah. I just think the best way to achieve personalization is from an actual person. So, you know, we, we recommend having our salespeople create videos introducing themselves when they send an email yeah. or, you know, you can do ABM and you can do, you know, use AI and do all these automated marketing techniques. Uh, but in the end, it means you need to actually put the faces of your people in front of your your prospects even more. I do agree with that. I mean, there's a challenge in the balance. Just like you say, I love the word paradox. It's a challenge in balance that we have to scale. The only way to scale is through automation. But at the same time, how can we scale not to lose that personal touch? And that will be a challenge actually for every single marketer moving forward. So, including both of us. <laughs> Always. Excellent. Excellent. So we really can't talk about content and the customer life cycle without talking about success metrics. Either one of you can take this first. How do we measure the success of content in relation to our conversions and our revenue metrics? Yeah, I mean, I'll go first with a super factual, you know, sort of objective statement. You need to measure reach, engage, convert, and retain every stage of, of the infinity loop, Jody, that you guys developed. Um, reach is basically, you know, are you are you ranking for the search terms that people are searching for? SEO is the new content marketing I wrote on Monday. Um, it's uh, 
it, it really just comes down to, you know, I, I love to say companies with growing traffic are, are thriving and companies with declining traffic are dying because you're either part of the conversation at an increasing rate or you're not. Uh, too few marketers feel that's a valuable metric. But then we need to get into, you know, are we engaging um, email newsletter subscribers, email database list growth are, are things yeah. to look at. Conversion, yeah. you know, we, marketers, we all know how to, how to measure conversion. I think the long lost art is retention. Um, and, and it's one of my favorite things, like segment your email newsletter database between customers and customers and look at the revenue. And you'll find like every client of ours, three to four times more revenue from email newsletter subscriber customers than customers that are not subscribed to your content. Figure out why, get them to subscribe, create the content they need and you'll see massive, massive increases in ROI. Yeah. So the couple of things I want to share in addition to Michael's point is content by itself is a piece of content. It's just like the furniture itself, it's just a piece of furniture. If you look at my background right there, right? If I'm just having a couch, that's fine. But if you put a cushion right next to it, just make that couch looks nicer, right? The content by itself, a blog is a blog. From my perspective, the best way to measure content is content needs to be a function of a marketing channel. The, 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 the content needs to be part of email marketing. The content needs to be part of the, your website. The content needs to be part of you know, the, your so, the call to action for your social media post. So the content needs to be a function of a marketing channel. So if you think from that perspective, your success metrics needs to be somehow tied in terms of how the marketing channels being measured. Right. So obviously, Michael was talking about the reach, engage, conversion and retention, but he, he also touches in terms of the, the email marketing, like, for example, the email marketing rate. The content is part of that email marketing. So if you want to measure the success of the content, it's not it's not like, OK, let's measure the, the download. That's great. But in terms of the opening rate, you are contributing to that as a content marketer. Well, take it, you know, take credit for it. Seriously. Right, so the only way to measure the content is as a function of a marketing channel. So the email subscriber is actually one of them. I 100% agree with you. I have done multiple different kind of uh, uh, marketing efforts. The email marketing, I hate saying this, still works. And when you see that, the, when you send out a webinar registration to your email subscribers, guess what? Majority of the people that signed up is gonna come from the email marketing, right? So email still working. The retention, I would like from, I would focus on the return rate on your website. If people are interested in your product, they're gonna come back to your website a couple more times. They want to see some content, they want to check out your product, right? And uh, because they download multiple things, well, now we're talking about lead, uh, lead scoring, but we're not, let's not go there. But if they come to your website, then one of the success metrics to measure that is retention and the return rate, right? So retention, how do you measure that? Return rate can be one of the measurement for uh, content marketers. So did I sound too excited about this topic? <laughs> That's why we're old friends, Pam. We, 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 we nerd out on content marketing metrics. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just kind of sad. Hashtag sorry, pathetic. Sorry for that. Sorry for that, Jody. <laughs> no, no. It's so exciting and refreshing to think about how content is now creating new pathways to revenue and innovative approaches to what we've talked about, the nonlinear customer life cycle. Um, as a lifelong marketer, I think it's thrilling that we're finally like marrying creative authenticity and technology to truly engage buyers in a meaningful way. I believe we have time now for Q&A. All right, let's yes, get started. Indeed. We've got a lot of questions actually that have come in. We will try to get to as many as we can, folks. Um, so let's just jump in here. Uh, James wants to know, how often mm -hmm. should you refine your customer journey or buyer personas? Uh, Michael, you want me to take on this one? Yeah, go ahead. All right, and it really depends on your industry and also your, um, the verticals. And uh, for example, like manufacturing segments, the the way they buy or your buyer probably doesn't change that often. Maybe you don't have to update that often. Does that make sense? So it's actually 
you have to look at your customers in terms of have your purchasing behavior change. In many, many enterprises that I know that they don't change their buyer's persona very often. However, pandemic, oh my God, this is like impact global scale, right? Everybody is like, we are changing our behavior, how we buy, how we uh, consume content, how we interact with our salespeople. Then during that time, you need to look into your buyer's persona and your customer journey. So my take on this is kind of like, understand your customer, use that as your guide to determine how often you want to change it. Does that make sense? Like when I was working for IT, man when I was working at Intel for IT managers, we only changed that every three or four years. We didn't change that often, but we evaluate every year. Does that make sense? Michael, do you have any additional things to add? No, I think you nailed it. Okay. Awesome. All right. Let me throw this one your way, Michael. Um, this is from Rebecca. She wants to know, how do you get your prospects to open up about their challenges without making them feel like you're trying to sell to them? Well, that's a great question, uh, Rebecca. Thank you for that. I mean, it's, you know, as a former salesperson, I, I, I used to love being able to ask customers those questions directly. It, marketers, I think, spend too, too little time with salespeople. Um, salespeople can be the proxy. Just ask them the, the challenges and questions that they're facing or they're hearing from, from prospects. Um, another thing is people forget that Google's the greatest research tool in the world. Uh, Google Autofill, so here's, a, here's my favorite story with Google Autofill. Uh, have a, a, a medical equipment manufacturing client targeting radiologists and they didn't know what to write about. They didn't know what their challenges were. And I said, well, let's just ask Google. So we went and said, radiologist space, and the next thing, the, the most most popular search query for radiologists was salary. Uh, so we created a radiology salary guide. It had nothing to do with the equipment they were trying to sell. Had a lot of challenges from the client. Should we be creating this content? The most successful piece of content they've ever created. Um, marketers love, a couple of years ago, it was Game of Thrones. So I wrote an article, why do marketers love Game of Thrones? Because we can learn storytelling tips from it. So, you know, I think there's lots of things that we can learn by just asking the salespeople we interact with every day, looking at Google, um, using some of the free tools that are out there, you can you can get a sense for the biggest challenges. You don't have to ask them directly. Fantastic. Pam, you got really excited by that question. Anything you want to add? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just want to say that uh, I work for myself now, so I'm a marketer and also biz dev. So that question, I was like, I always like, you know what? What should I say so I don't sound very salty? You know, so I just at the technical level, I 100% agree with the Michael's point of view. Like a lot of ideas you can generate by looking at Google's and looking at different things that people care the most, and write from that perspective and use that as a conversational opener to mm -hmm. start having a conversation. And I like that. The other one is, you know, sharing content. Like, hey, I found this piece of content that was very useful. I just want to share with you. So start from that. You know, usually you have that kind of conversation. That's because your purchasing cycle is kind of low. So anyway. Excellent. You know, you know, I love that form of content marketing after all. So yes, <laughs> share your great content. Don't, don't necessarily sell. Um, okay. Jennifer has a question. First, a statement. She says, we have a strategy in place, but execution is tough. Yes. Uh, what are your recommendations for managing the content development process? Michael just gave a great tip about going outside of what you would normally think about writing about for radiologists, but what are other some, from a process standpoint, what tips do you all have? So Michael, can I take this one? Yeah, please. Okay. So I was start with what is the format of the content that you are creating? That's set the editorial plan aside. You, you basically say you have strategy already. So when you have a strategy, you probably already know what kind of content you're going to create. I assume that. All right. Once you have that, you the next step is what format. And the way I have noticed that because I do podcasting, I do videos, and I do blogging, and I notice different formats of content, they have a slightly different process. I hate saying this. And I'm not in that. So the way that you are going to manage it, I would start from uh, you have a plan, you have the editorial, you have your content that you are going to create right? Focus, don't focus on like 50 pieces of content you have to create. You have finite time and resources. Focus on the top 10 or top three. Start from there. Try to manage the hero content or the content that require the most budget. Manage that well and take it from there. There are some content, you probably don't have to manage it. You might have a team that's doing it. You might have a subject matter expert is working with a, a, a contractor is making things out. Well, that doesn't manage that. 
focus on prioritizing in terms of what content you want to focus. The one that usually take the most time consuming and the highest budget tend to be a long form content or the video thought leadership content, you know, things to that extent. So focus, prioritize, and then determine what is the process you want to manage on those hero content. That would be how I would go about it. So Michael, great advice. Yeah, no, I would agree. I just add just quickly, you know, I, I think Robert Rose taught me early on as, as, as one of my greatest mentors in content marketing, the calendar is a forcing function for your strategy. Um, yeah, like and, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, so, you know, SAP, our, our, our motto was an article every day. And we found a way to solve that problem, you know, borrowing, begging, stealing, you know, and a little bit of budget. And we found a way, but, but it, you know, the results were tremendous. And, and it was because we stuck to that, to that commitment. That's great because the consistency matters a lot. You know, I mean, if one a day might be hard for a lot of brands, but maybe it's once a week or every other week, but the consistency does matter for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, Sarah's got a good question. Um, what is the key differentiator between content that engages and content that nurtures? Hmm. I mean, I, well, I'll just jump in, Pam. You can chime in as well. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I know what the, I mean, I know. I would think we can define the differences between engage and nurture. I, I would think engage is a, is a stage of nurture, um, like getting attention is a stage of nurture, getting deeper engagement is a stage of nurture, getting conversion is a deeper stage of engagement. So I, I think it really is all kind of a, a, a grade, you know, sort of a, a spectrum. But, but I think the thing that's really important for me to, to this question is content that is engaging for one and attracting for another or engaging for one and converting for another could be the same piece of content. And so one of the things I remember um, learning in, in doing a, a really broad vertically focused content plan um, for one of our clients was that the content that converts for one audience can be the, re the retention or attraction content for another audience. So you know, I, we, we found surprising things. So I'll give you an example. This was an IT company and they created a lot of technical content, but when they created content about how to be a better manager, it drove more conversions than the technical content. And why does that make sense? Because, well, you know, IT people are managers too, and they want to learn how to manage their team. And that was just the biggest challenge that they were able to solve with some credibility. And that somehow drove, you know, conversions and nurtured their new prospects into becoming prospects and clients. So I would say be open to the fact that you won't know, you know, what the best content is for each person. Uh, as long as you're creating it to answer their needs, it's going to, it's going to, you know, drive people down the funnel. I, I would like to add um, additional thoughts from a slightly different perspective. I agree with Michael and in terms of when I was, when, uh, when I heard that question, engage and nurture, I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. But uh, if you are a marketer in the trenches and you are looking to, okay, should I create a content for, uh, for engaging or should I create a content for nurture? From my perspective, there are two things. Number one is what is your own definition of engagement? What is also your own definition of nurturing, right? Engagement is that these two things, however you defined it, has a lot to do also with your call to action. If you actually define the engagement as request for demo, that will drive in terms of how you're going to write that piece of content and leads to your call to action request for demo. Because you want the person to engage with me. At the end of the day, we want that somebody to actually say, you know what, I'm interested, I want to see your product. Right? Maybe that's your definition of engagement. Nurturing is people is not ready to buy yet. They are not. You have to nurture them, right? They were like, mm, I don't know about that. I want to think about it, right? So then that will have you, you're going to create content, something like maybe you can help them to make choices. Maybe you can help them to actually, like, like uh, Michael indicated, something that's adjacent to it, but it's not directly related to what you want, what you want them to do yet. Does that make sense? So the way I would see it is a definition, your own definition, of engagement and nurturing, and also call to action does matter. So. Brilliant, love it. Back to you, Stephanie, back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. 
<laughs> Love your animation. Love it. Um, <laughs> let's see if we can squeeze in one or two more here before we're out of time. Um, Jessica is making the point that her organization is going from startup to really trying to scale, right, with, with the content function. So her question is, is it important that the content function have a seat at the table and be its own separate entity versus being placed under a different marketing function? Such a, such a tough question. I mean, like we're in the lightning round with just a few minutes left. I'll just give a, I'll give a quick answer. I think the answer is yes. I mean, one of the things that we talk about with best practices of content marketing is that there is accountability with someone or some group and that that, that person or group um, has the support of the executive function. You know, we, we talk to CEOs about the importance of using your website as a digital asset to drive growth. Um, the CEO needs to understand that in order for, for the content function to be successful. It, the answer is going to depend in a lot of ways on the size and, you know, type of company. But, but yes, I think there needs to be, uh, um, you know, sort of a, a, a total buy-in from the executive level. Yeah, I like to, I actually agree with that in terms of the, the content the, the thing is, content can be very squishy sometimes, right? And what is the content? And the, the, if you talk to senior management, it's like content marketing, what is that? You know, I mean, it's like sales collateral, is that content? You know, like it's very, very hard. So having an executive buying, I think is very, very critical. Michael hit the nail on that one. But Thanks. should that be a separate function, you know, within the marketing or the, the, the peer of the marketing, or should that be part of marketing? That's completely depends on the company how you want to structure it. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. I mean, there is content for marketing and there's content marketing and they really are different things. You know, so. Yeah, I agree um, with you. That one, yes. Yeah. Somebody wrote an uh, article on CMI about that. I don't know. Who I know it was it was Ann Ginn, and it was fantastic. <laughs> and I I can't remember who she quoted, but a lot of really good people. So, <laughs> um, yeah. What about okay? Last one. Um, what's your take on ABM content? Oh. Pam, you go first. All right, ABM account based marketing. Oh my God, my favorite topic. Do I sound excited about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, the ABM content, um, from my perspective, ABM is basically account-based marketing. So it's account specific, right? And you start on the ABM, that's because you start working with sales on, the, on key accounts. Let's not talk about if you scale the ABM marketing, uh, use a programmatic ads or whatnot. That's just talking about you work with the sales on strategic account and you are creating an account specifically for that. So there are certain elements in account-based marketing content that tend to be scale, uh, that tend to be customized for that specific account. You can repurpose using the existing marketing account that you have that much for broader outreach, you know, for uh, your target customers, your specific uh, 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 buyer's persona. But when you take that content and you are looking into account-specific engagement, you have to look at that content and see if you have to modify it for that account's needs. Does that make sense? So a lot of strategic accounts, the salespeople have their game plan. And also depending on different sales stages. So depending on how that content will be used at what stage, you might need to modify it. And so it's kind of like a judgment call. So... Helpful, very helpful. Yes, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, Jody, any closing words from you before we wrap? Well, first off, brilliant questions and answers. Awesome, I'm glad everybody is, is interacting with us today. I just want to thank both Michael and Pam for speaking with me today and sharing your knowledge and insights with our audience. There was a lot of substance today, and I'm really thrilled about that. I'd like to encourage our participants to, let me get the slide. Oh, I think I, I lost the slide. Well, I would like our <laughs> participants to visit, oh, there we go, right thank right you there, so right much. <laughs> I'd like to encourage our participants to download the assets available to you in our session and be sure to visit the websites on your screen for more insights, mm -hmm. inspiration, and content. Thank you so much for joining us. Make it a great day. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Um, to the audience, you know, stay tuned for our next session, which starts up in uh, 
just about 14 minutes or so. Uh, you'll need to log out here and log back into that one. We're talking about turning clicks into conversations. Pam, Jody, Michael, thank you so much. Um, if we did not answer your questions uh, during this session, folks, we will send them on to Pam and Michael and Jody to make sure we get those answered for you. So thanks for attending, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.